Hopefully someone is going to run the PowerPoint for me. Is that okay? Ah, here we are. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'll just go next slide whenever we get to it. Uh, hopefully some films will work and it will help explain what it is that I'm doing. At the moment, I'm actually sitting in a deserted lecture theatre at Coventry University uh, because next door we're actually running a version of this project with um, Purdue University in, in, in Indiana, in the United States of America. So we're working on uh, Bertolt Brecht's The Life of Galileo. So could we go to the next slide? Uh, this project came about almost by accident. It, it's a kind of, it's a reverse engineered project. Uh, the, the desire to work together came first, the technology came second. What happened was, um, I work with colleagues in the University of Tampere in Finland. So I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm partners in project with uh, Mikko Kanan and Tina Seria, Matthias Paolo, who work in the University of Tampere in Finland. And we wanted to make some theater together, but we really didn't know um, how we were going to do this. We knew that the funding involved uh, working online somehow. But we couldn't quite get our heads around uh, how we were going to make theatre together, how we were going to conduct a course in theatre together, because we're theatre directors, we're theatre makers. And um, although we, you know, we, we knew our technology, we all like computers, we couldn't find a solution for uh, being able to actually rehearse, perform and have a series of workshops together. Uh, so hopefully the next slide will play the film and you'll see what it was we came up with. So can we go to the next slide and hopefully it will play? In the end, I was really surprised how um, how immersive it could be to act out a scene um, just with this screen in as the connector. But once you got used to it, it kind of felt that we were in the same room. Um, all the um, distance got smaller and smaller. It's made the world seem smaller, it's more accessible. Yeah, I love it. I, I, do. I can't get enough of it. I, I genuinely, I love, I love this project. Yeah. I love, I love how unique it is. So really, this, this was a great way to bring people from other countries together. In the same room, really. Mm -hmm. And open up new possibilities for future projects. I feel like this is very beneficial for us thinking about the future. You now we have all these new people in our lives. Never be thought of as a gimmick. It's a good tool. And once we got the whole of it, it was really like a very magical experience, almost. You to was, have these yeah. people in the same room with you and also um, another country. Life-sized. Mm. We all sort of came together as, as sort of like kids in a playground. Mm. Kids make friends without without worry, and we all sort of jumped at each other like and made friends. So it was quite exciting the whole experiment. So we really felt that we met personally, and during the virtual lessons that we were in the same room, and the distance got smaller and smaller. Yeah, I'm, I'm not picking this up. <laughs> Okay, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. I hope everybody was able to see that. Um, um, what we didn't know is that there's a long history. This is the boring history part. Uh, there's a long history of this stuff. So this is a picture of uh, Thaddeus Cahill's um, 
uh, Teleharmonium 1895, which weighed several tons and uh, was a device that they used to kind of try and transmit uh, music over uh, the telephone exchange. Um, really ungainly, uh, interfered with the telephone exchange, of course, uh, and on one occasion brought down the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, so it was finally melted down to scrap. And uh, next slide, please, which was kind of a, a kind of major influence on as well is uh, Kit Galloway and Sherry Rabinovitz's uh, large experiment hole in space in 1980, in which they linked uh, New York and Los Angeles together via satellite technology with this kind of life-sized screen and um, gave no real explanation as to what it was. But over the course of several days, people met, they danced, they sang together. And this is actually hopefully a little project we're, we're hoping to revisit in 2021 for Coventry City of Culture. So we're hoping to kind of uh, look at potentially doing a sequel to uh, Hole in Space. So can we move to the next slide, please? Thank you. So we had this challenge. We had uh, we wanted to work together. We actually wanted to work on some Shakespeare together, and we were 1,125 miles apart. Now, at this point in my life, I didn't know guys like Claudio or Justin, who I've since met, and I had the pleasure of, of having the benefit of their many years of knowledge and experience. But at this point in our lives, we really didn't know what we were doing. We were going to use Skype. Uh, we were going to use whatever we could get our hands on. Uh, and as, as we began to explore the way of making work, we discovered that Skype really wasn't going to work. Google Hangouts wasn't really going to work. And so we began to drift towards the idea of creating a space. And it was out of necessity rather than um, uh, rather than a desire to kind of work this way in the first place. We really were um, struggling with how we were going to do it. So we came up with this idea of this immersive space, and I'll show you a little clip from where we got the idea in a few slides' time. Uh, we used basic video conferencing, business video conferencing. Uh, we used rear projection because we had a rear projection screen. We were actually, Coventry were based in a wind tunnel because that was the only place we could get to have this experiment. So we were in an, an old uh, Coventry University where I work, uh, has a big engineering department. They had an abandoned wind tunnel where they used to um, test aircraft engines. So we moved all of our theater equipment over there and we used um, social media for scheduling uh, because we always use that when we do a play. We always create a Facebook group. And we used the Adobe Connect video conferencing app for lectures. Uh, but also it has, as you will discover, a, a, a very strange side effect that we didn't expect as well. Uh, shall we move to the next slide? Uh, and then we started to discover these things which we'd never thought of before, latency, bandwidth, and jitter. Uh, I have this kind of explanation because this presentation I've had to do to um, lots of senior management types who don't quite understand what latency is. And to be honest, I don't think our uh, knowledge of latency was particularly sophisticated in the first year, but it's become something that we've become obsessed with over the years. Uh, the idea that the further you are away, the longer the signal needs to take to get the round trip. And the metaphor I now use uh, to try and explain to um, people at work, it's pizza delivery. You want warm pizza. You don't want cold pizza. So you need to ensure that the pizza delivery guy can get to you as quickly as possible with the pizza. So you, you want a clear road. You don't want many traffic lights. You don't want roadworks. You don't want accidents and you want the pizza delivery guy to take the shortest trip possible, otherwise you'll end up with cold and soggy pizza. Um, latency is always going to be with us. We're not really going to beat the speed of light, but we can do our best to try and uh, reduce the number of obstacles uh, as many as we can. And you've got guys like Claudio uh, working with Lola who are doing great, great work in trying to get rid of uh, as, as many of the obstacles we have to latency and as many of the little roadblocks that we can experience. Shall we move to the next slide? That's my little science bit. Uh, latency, we can have a little demonstration. 
distribution of it, see, so Nico, if you count in one, two, three clap, and we get everyone here to clap, okay? Sure. I'll count with you. I'll count. So when we get to three, everyone here clap. Sorry, I'm tired as well. And then you'll, you'll hear the difference. So one, two, three. Yeah. So if we move to the next slide. Uh, so this is how we started. We started with a flat screen television. Uh, this is us doing a latency test just to see. So the guys on the screen are in Finland. And this was what it was meant to be. This was how we started. Um, that last clip I showed um, was us actually trying to demonstrate latency from Hong Kong to Finland. We were standing in Hong Kong. Uh, the other actors were in Finland, and we were trying to explain to the audience this is how latency works. And the second part of the clip was our first encounter with latency. So it was our very first encounter when we tried to play a theater game, which relied on split second timing. And as Miko said, it doesn't work because when she turns, everybody moves. When she moves, everybody turns. Uh, so we, we just couldn't get it to work in the first year. But it gave us enough hope that what we were doing was interesting enough to actually then learn our craft and to actually discover more about uh, the science behind what we were doing. So that's uh, where we were. I'm going to show you a quick clip next. So if we move to the next slide of where we got the idea for the space from. So this is where the idea for the way we constructed the space came from. So if we just move to the next slide. Okay. So, on the screen, we can see several avatars uh, who we can hear if they decide to speak. Anybody want to say hello no. there? <laughs> speak up, they're much. Okay. Yeah. So, anyway, this, this is primarily so that the people who are in will actually see what it looks like uh, in the live space here. Okay, so what we've got is a mock up very similar to the space in Second Life. In the space, we've got a number of cubes, uh, red, white, blue, and yellow. We have a board here. Uh, ooh, it's about 2 metres by 1.2, I think, are the actual dimensions of this. Uh, and this is where the avatars uh, who've been extracted get projected onto. Um, and behind it, above it, and behind it, there's a loudspeaker so that your voice actually comes from behind the image. Um, this is then picked up uh, by a camera it's over here. Either side of the screen, uh, there's, a, there's a camera, and they pick up uh, the, the uh, images for the screens that go in Second Life. There's one here. Oh, that's the biggest picture of Ian I've seen. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Another one here. And then there's a third one above that, which picks up the image of people on the insert unit over here. Now the insert unit has a pressure pack, which turns the lights on and off. If I stand back and forth, you can probably see the lights go on and off, lights go on and off. Okay. You can also hear a whooshing sound, uh, which I'll show you where that is plugged in at the back, which is the computer that runs it. But that links to the lights and to the sound. And also, you're picked up by um, the infrared camera. And I just noticed the infrared light isn't actually on at the moment. Or is it? Oh, I can't see it because the lights are too bright. Okay. Right, so. Oh, and up above our head, we have uh, a microphone here. Ian's pointing to it. I'm pointing to it. Um, and that's linked in to the 
uh, avatar XC01, which is the camera avatar in second life. So, yeah, so that was a colleague of mine, Geoff Schaefer, and he had um, done an art installation. He works a lot with the uh, programme Second Life, or he worked a lot with the programme Second Life. He was a puppeteer who then became interested in digital puppetry. And uh, it, in conjunction with the artist Stellark, who some of you may know, uh, he's the guy with an ear uh, grafted to his elbow, uh, they uh, created this thing called Extract Insert, where someone would stand on a pressure pad and their avatar would be extracted and inserted into the Second Life world, and they could interact with it. But what really interested us was the idea of the two identical rooms. So they had a digital world filled with avatars on screen, and then they had those three blocks that you might have seen on the ground in the real world. And we thought, well, what if we could do this with real life? What if we could build two identical rehearsal spaces, uh, link it through video conferencing technology, light both spaces in the same way, uh, use microphones, etc., to create a kind of immersive rehearsal room. So if you could move to the next slide, please. So we began to make all kinds of discoveries with it. And I should say we're still in a process of discovery uh, in what we're doing. Um, we, called it a, we called it a virtual room the first time around, uh, which was completely the wrong thing to call it because it wasn't a virtual room at all. But that was our level of thinking at that point. We were completely new to this. Um, every day was completely new. Every day something happened we didn't expect to happen. Um, all kinds of discoveries, like about eye contact. We discovered if we placed the camera in a certain way, if we placed the projector in a certain way in both spaces, we could get the illusion of eye contact. Um, we discovered that we couldn't rehearse the same way that we rehearsed in a normal rehearsal room, we had to actually acknowledge the technology. Uh, and if you move to the next slide, I'll show you one instance of where we went wrong in the very first year. Uh, if you look at the taped out areas on the floor, so this is the view from Finland. Uh, and as you can see, both rooms were not identical. The Coventry room being a wind tunnel didn't look anything like the temporary room. So that was one problem. Uh, also being a wind tunnel, it was very echoey. Uh, which played havoc with the microphones on the temporary side. Uh, so it, it didn't. It, it worked enough to give us confidence to continue with the project, but it didn't work well enough to be a fully satisfying thing. And the taped out areas on the floor were where we really went wrong. Uh, we were obsessed with the uh, actors appearing actual size on the screen. So we taped out areas to indicate where they should stand. So two boxes and one central box for people to do speeches. It was much too restrictive. It, it stopped them from playing. We told them to ignore the technology, which made them very awkward. It made, and after two days of struggling to rehearse in the same way that we normally do, we completely abandoned every single plan we had. And we let them play with the technology. We let them play with the camera. We let them play it with the microphones. We played with the idea of proximity. We played with the idea of close-ups, of being far away. And we discovered something very counterintuitive. The minute we acknowledged the technology, the technology became completely invisible to the performers. When we told them to ignore the technology, it was painfully visible. When we told them to embrace the technology, it actually became invisible. Uh, so can we move to the next slide? Another thing that was completely accidental was how we used Adobe Connect. So this is a shot of the third year of the project, uh, Twelfth Night, when we were working with Helsinki and Gothenburg in, in Finland and Sweden. And that was just us orientating. We gave each group their own Adobe Connect room to learn lines, to uh, kind of do some work that... Um, uh, we needed them to do in order to prepare for the main room. And so we gave them their own room. In two slides time, I'll show you the unexpected side effect of those rooms. Uh, and so we don't go into those rooms. They're outside the rehearsal room. They don't exist in the rehearsal room. They're the students' own rooms. They're password protected. They can go into those rooms. They can rehearse their lines. And of course they do 
lots of other things that they're not meant to do. And over the years we've gone, this is incredibly important because this is the coffee break. This is the bit where they get away from the directors. This is the bit where they bond as actors. Uh, this is the bit where they bitch about the director and say the director doesn't know what they're doing. So these are kind of important. Um, go to the next slide where I'll show you some clips from the King Lear rehearsals. And then you start to rock yourself forward and backwards. Try to balance yourself. Try to find the balance of today. It's okay if it was something different yesterday, but the balance of today. And quite fast you can notice that you have to keep your knees a little bit bent. with our body and mind and every time thought emerges take it is it about coffee or tea or that I'm bored or anything take the thought and pass it along imagine the ball lift it with your back here so it really, you never get to the full extent. You always leave some movement at the end. So I'm not going all close, but I'm leaving a little bit. And same thing with here. I'm not going, I don't extend the 100%. I'm leaving a little bit at the ball end. Okay, so that was some, some exercises. And this is the slide I was talking about. This was the, I think this was a major, I used to show this slide as a joke. It's actually, I think, central to, the, to what we've been doing. Um, the very first year when we worked on Coriolanus, we never met up. We rehearsed uh, in Coventry, we rehearsed in Tampere, and the students didn't get to physically meet. And at the end of the two weeks' work, we, we really thought, oh, it would be really nice to have a beer together. That's what actors do when we finish a project. We go and we have a beer. But we couldn't because we were in two separate countries. And later that night on the Facebook group, the students, the actors posted this. They'd gone for virtual beer. They'd taken their Adobe Connect rehearsal room and they'd gone out drinking. And as the evening went on, that room filled with more and more students in different locations, some in their homes, some in bars, some in Finland, some in Coventry, some in Birmingham. And they were having a beer together. And we thought, hang on, this is a digital community. This is, um, these tools work in harmony with each other. And so we've really upped the use of these little supporting apps. Uh, this year, 
actually we had our first telepresence relationship. So we have a guy who was in a scene with, uh, we worked with uh, Poznan in Poland. So we worked with Adam Miskiewicz University in Poznan on Julius Caesar. One of our actors was working with his scene partner uh, on Caesar. They were both in the scene when they met up uh, in Poznan to work in the scene. They started a relationship. It's still going strong. She's been over to see him in plays over here. He's back and forward to Poznan all the time. So, you know, relationships that I kind of um, maybe thought that in, in the digital world couldn't happen have started to happen uh, through this project. And I think the theater aspect is, is fantastic. Um, but for us in the UK, especially, I think it's become increasingly important to keep in touch with the rest of the world, especially our colleagues in Europe. Uh, can we move, sorry for being political today, uh, but um, can we move to the next slide, please? So we've had to kind of look at a new way of rehearsing and performing together because obviously we're in two dimensions. We're, um, uh, we're not in three dimensions that we are in when we work in, in a real rehearsal room. And so we've deliberately started to throw in problems yeah. into scenes um, to see how the students will solve it, to see how the actors will solve it. We've been looking at the sensations of touch. Um, at the minute, as I say, working on Galileo, we're working at physical demonstrations of science. So we're looking at scenes in which uh, geocentric orbits have to be created by actors, where um, we have to demonstrate the Ptolemaic system, we have to demonstrate the Copernican system, and we have to make science and theatre exciting and, and the story of Galileo's discoveries exciting. But we deliberately will uh, create these problems for the actors to solve by casting people in opposition to each other. Uh, for example, with Poznan, uh, when we were working on Julius Caesar, we placed Caesar in Poznan, but the conspirators who stab Caesar in Coventry, uh, which is counterintuitive, but means that the actors have to be creative in how we solve those staging problems of acting through the screen. Uh, the next clip uh, we're going to show is just a scene from King Lear, which is quite an intimate scene, where we try to use close-ups to uh, simulate the, the sensation of touch at a distance. So can we just move to the next clip? Like Thank you. Yes. Yeah. 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 You know, the eye contact is so difficult because yeah. I know is there any possibility to get any eye contact? Yeah, but when you, when you just... look into the camera, you're looking straight into in the camera. So when, oh, when, when yeah. she looks at <laughs> see, if I look <laughs> there, I'm looking at you. Yeah. And if you look yeah. there, you're looking yeah. at me. If you look there. So I mean, yeah. I, I don't think, don't be afraid of, like, almost trying to, to touch yeah. the screen, you know, yeah. 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 <laughs> and see what happens. Should we do this one yeah. more time and then we'll swap over yeah. you guys? And we'll yeah. play as well? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Short. Do not laugh at me. 
or as I am a man. I think this lady to be my child. Cordelia? Cordelia? And so I am. I am. Your tears wet. Yes, faith. I pray, weep not. If you have poison for me, I will drink it. Yeah, so can we move on? So, I mean, again, this is a scene between Lear and Cordelia. Um, so we, we, we really tried to look at how they could touch at a distance and, and how uh, we could create that sense of intimacy. And we discovered things like close-up. Uh, you're never really that close to somebody unless you're intimate with them. And it's very unusual for an actor to see another actor live in that very large scale. Um, I, um, if we could just uh, go ahead two slides. So I've done quite a lot of film work, but I'm aware of time. So if we can just uh, skip ahead another slide and just skip the next film. So could we just skip ahead another one? Yeah, I have a lot of films. We have a website. If you want to see all of this stuff, there's a website in which we've kind of archived everything. So the lessons we've learned are, uh, it really requires experimentation. Um, we're still experimenting. I mean, uh, one of the things we've said is we have a schedule, but we have no plan. Uh, we don't pre-plan. Um, I'm working with Purdue University in Indiana at the minute, and, and one of the things, one of the difficulties of working with a new partner is um, it, it seems incredibly loose. It, it seems incredibly unplanned what we're doing. It, it almost seems uh, chaotic, um, especially if you're very organized people. And uh, I think we're only two days in. I think they've started to discover this method in our madness in that I don't like to think ahead about what's going to happen in the room. I like to create an atmosphere where the students or the actors will play. I like to think there's no wrong answers. I like to think we'll try anything. I like to think that there are no rules to a certain extent in this space where we can play with the technology, we can play with the space, um, where we can play with the media. Uh, so the imagination becomes more important for the actor than the experience. And I think sometimes the actors have to relearn um, staging techniques, uh, relearn their ideas of proximity, their, idea their ideas that they've learned in the conventional rehearsal room. I find it an incredibly exciting uh, space to work in. I'm going to finish with two contrasting slides. Uh, one, uh, the first one are some clips from our collaboration on Twelfth Night uh, with the University of Helsinki. And it's just some games we were playing to see what we could do in the room. And the last one uh, was the most ambitious project we ever did. And I really have to thank Justin Trieger for this one, was the opening performance at New World Symphony of Network Performing Arts Production Workshop in 2018, uh, where we used a piece of technology called a Nimbra, uh, which enabled us to do live motion capture and to have live music streamed with a live actor. And Justin and the guys in New World Symphony were incredibly patient and um, went through this enormously difficult uh, tech setup and kind of trusted us that we would, um, we would pull something off that wasn't totally and utterly embarrassing. So if we can just play the next two slides uh, or the next two films.
I think that kind of gives you a flavor. So if we move to the next slide and we'll just show the New World Sympathy or Symphony work. performance. He's spending the day with uh, someone else. He starts to yell at her and smash things in the trailer. So this is a piece of technology called an Imbra Media Server, which is quite expensive. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah. as Justin will vouch, quite difficult to set up, um, but very stable and allows you to um, do multiple streams with very few drop frames. And so we have a live actor in Tampere in a virtual studio in a motion capture suit and um, interacting with a live actor in Miami and a live musician in Tampere accompanying them live. Um, Probably the thing that gave us the most problem was the motion capture and not the uh, the stream at all. So it was the, the motion capture that caused the most difficulty. Just was worried about him and that got him even madder. Why? Well, because he thought that if she never got jealous of him, then that meant that she didn't really care about him. Jealousy was a sign of her love for him. And then uh, one night, one night she told him she was pregnant and she was about three or four months pregnant and he didn't even know it. And uh, that changed everything. He stopped drinking, he got a steady job and he was convinced now that she loved him because she was carrying his child. And he was gonna dedicate his life to making a home for him. But, um, then something funny started to happen. What? He didn't even really notice at first, but uh, she started to change. From the minute the baby was born, she got irritated by everything around her. She got mad at everything. Even the baby seemed to be an injustice to her. And he tried to make her happy. Buy her things, take her out to dinner once a week, but nothing seemed to satisfy her. And so for two years, he did everything he could to try to pull them back together to the place that they were when they first met, but he knew it was never going to work out, so he hit the bottle again. But this time it got me. This time when he came home late at night drunk, she wasn't worried about him or jealous, she just was enraged. She accused him of holding her captive by making her have the baby. She told him that she dreamed about escaping, that all she dreamed about was escape. She told him how she saw herself running naked down a highway, running across fields, cross river beds, always running. And always when she was just about to get away, he'd stop her. She would just get away and he would be there to stop her. He'd appear and he'd be there and he'd stop her somehow. And when she told him these dreams, he knew they were real. He knew she had to be stopped or she'd disappear out of his life forever. So he net a cowbell to her ankle. So if she tried to escape and run down to the highway, he'd hear her, but she got wise and she learned to muffle the sound of the cowbell by stuffing a sock in it. So that is, is probably the, the thing that we're proudest of. That's probably the performance and the experiment that we were proudest of. Um, it was inordinately difficult uh, even to set up. Um, but um, I think it showed the kind of potential of, of where we'd like to go with this in terms of performance. I mean, we now have kind of two strands of research. We have our rehearsal strand and we have our performance strand. And they are kind of different languages. Um, and in fact, we're meeting on Monday morning at 7 a.m. to talk about where we go next. So myself and we've had a year where we've been working with other people. I'm working with Purdue and I'm working with, uh, I've worked with Adam Miskovic University in Poznan. And um, yeah, next week we're getting the gang back together. So myself and Finland are getting back together to uh, 
to start working on where we go next with this. And we don't know, to be honest, where we're going to go next with this. Uh, but it, it's incredibly exciting. And I've, it's the most fun I've ever had in theatre. Uh, I'm hooked on it now. So thank you very much.